we've already covered paragraphs one through four on the front side. Essentially, Franco's laying out um, this idea that that finding that we have this kind of existential vacuum that we're in, and we're suffering from pain and guilt and death, and that these are things that kind of overcome us constantly. Especially, he points out in industrial societies. Um, paragraph two and uh, three, he's talking about, and four, he's talking about how we need an optimism to, con to continue on, but that optimism can't be commanded. Just like you can't order a person to love you, you can't order a person to even hate you. But we have to have reason for these things. And he points out that laughter is a big one. That you can't uh, just command a person to laugh. Um, I mentioned before, by the way, that laughter is a huge thing for Frankl. He thinks that this is a great way for us to overcome suffering. How can you, you know, if something is, so, is extremely painful, how can you deal with it? Well, you can laugh about it. And if you understand that, then you probably understand why it is that some of your favorite comedians are some of your favorite comedians. Probably because they joke about things that we're not supposed to joke about, and that, and usually it's about some, you know, tragic things, well, things that are tragic in some way or another, and that they give us a reason to laugh through it, and just to get, and to get past it. And so for Frankel, I mean, again, I mentioned before that I've seen a number of interviews with Frankel, and he doesn't even have a problem with Holocaust jokes, you know? And this is a guy who was in concentration camps because he understands what it is. That's a, it's a process of, of getting past the suffering. So in paragraphs uh, four and five, I covered them also, that um, we're suffering from this thing he mentions in, in 1983 of give up itis. And I talked before about the, the, the absolute power of, of give up itis, this idea that there's no point in even trying. You know, we just kind of quit. And it's important, it's important for us to see that Frankel, he understands that although we can become individuals, many people are not, and that even if we are individuals, that we're still human. So for example, if you guys have cats or dogs, you'll swear up and down that your cats and dogs have personalities, right? Yeah, and they're still a cat, and they're still a dog. Now they have little things that they do differently from other cats and dogs, but fundamentally they're still that thing, the cat and the dog. And they don't have the type of free will that we have, or at least an, uh, an idea of free will, to make ourselves more different from other people around us. So there's still going to be that thing. That being the case, we can trace a lot of our, of our behaviors back to this almost like collective um, mass behavior. So in paragraph 5, he talks about people in the concentration camp when they gave up. They seem to follow this one process. And you might say, well, you know, you can't, we don't know everyone who does that's going to do it. No, but by and large, this is what happened. And if you understand that, then you understand some things about human nature. And then that makes it easier for you to predict how things are going to turn out. You may not be 100% certain and to know in the, in the Socratic sense that this is how things are going to turn out. But you have a sense of it because of your experience in life. Um, paragraph 6, he talks about the, the no future generation of, of, of the 80s. And I was pointing out that every generation seems to have this thing about how we have no future. Now, why is it that every generation thinks it has no future? Well, because similar to what I was just talking about. What does the future look like? We can't picture it. Good answer. Yeah, no, we are, either we can't picture it or we just don't know. Now, going back to what I've said a million times before, what is it that populates your closet when you're a little kid? What populates the darkness? What populates under your bed? Imaginary. These monsters, yeah, these imaginary monsters. So when we don't, when we just can't conceive of the future, we tend to populate it with monsters, and it becomes very terrifying to us. We don't know what's out there. So then we start to revert back to thinking about, hey, no future, man, we're ruined, we're in deep trouble. And you can see that manifest. I was talking last period about just a few examples, and I'm, and I'm not saying any of these things are real or not. I'm just saying kind of see the process. If you're growing up in the 70s. Um, there was a problem. The world was going to end soon. Why? Because there was an ice age that was on the way. You know, we saw this pattern that the earth was, was cooling, and there was this terror that we were all going to freeze to death and die. All of our vegetation would go away. We wouldn't have anything to eat. Our uh, animals wouldn't have anything to eat, so then there would be like this mass starvation, and then this was it. We were done. Um, hasn't happened yet, maybe, in the future, but hasn't happened yet. And then you also had this problem coming up after that were killer bees. These bees from Africa, they're, they're, they're much bigger than normal bees, and they're very aggressive. So they were coming up and they were stinging people, and they'd all swarm and kill you. So there was this terror of these like, massive swarms of, 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 of killer bees that were coming up from, you know, uh, come in and kind of spreading all over the world. Well, that didn't actually manifest. Nothing ended up coming from it. 
And then you start, you know, you progress further and you've got the 90s and now it's no longer global warm, it's no longer global cooling, it's now global warming. So there's this terror that the ice caps are gonna melt that will all be underwater. And then the, the, the models have kind of shifted over time, so now we just kind of make it a blanket climate change. So regardless of what that climate change looks like, cooler, warmer, whatever it's going to be, now there's a concern about all of that. And then going back even to my generation, we were looking at, um, you know, the Soviet Union had collapsed. And so that left the United States as the only superpower in the world. And so even though we didn't have that terror, we suffered from a different type of terror, which was, well, not knowing what the future looked like, you know? My point is that there's a suggestion that, and again, not saying that any of these things are real or not, or that, or that we understand, I guess I should say, not saying that any of these things are things that we understand them entirely and completely. And any kind of a statement that we do is just, it's a, it shows a lack of understanding of history, and it shows a, it demonstrates a, a, an extreme arrogance, given how wrong we've been all these times. And again, that's not to say that we are wrong this time, I'm just saying, understand what I'm saying. Um, but why is it that we have these things? Well, because we need something to fight against. You know, looking at my generation, the Soviet Union had collapsed. We were the world's only superpower. We were economically prosperous. Our culture was dominating the world. And now there's no real fight to have. So what happened? Well, my generation, we, we, we started scowling. We grew out some facial hair and longer hair. We put on flannel and Doc Martens. And then we said something about, we were singing something about teen spirit. You know, that whole kind of movement comes against this idea of commercialism. Oh, we started drinking uh, $5 cups of coffee because, you know, commercialism is bad. So you see this kind of even a, a hypocrisy that develops within these sorts of movements. So the idea is just that when we don't know what the future looks like, we populate it with terrifying things. And so Frankel doesn't acknowledge that here, but it's, it's, there's a good indication that that is what's going on. And he points in paragraph 7 to the, to the drug scene, this idea of us trying to fill up um, our void by escaping this, this, no, this, um, this uncertainty for something else. So paragraph 8, he continues, uh, as to the causation of the feeling of meaninglessness, one may say, and this is an exceptionally important paragraph, this is one here where you want to asterisk, star, bracket, highlight, underline, put arrows to, whatever it is that you do. One may say that people have enough to live by, but nothing to live for. They have the means, but no meaning. Meaning that even if we think of ourselves as poor today, we're poor in relation, maybe, to the extreme material wealth that's going on all around us. Um, we have more today than we've ever had before in terms of material, in terms of money, in terms of means. But we're also suffering from this, this loss of meaning. It's almost like the more stuff we have, the, the, the more we have to complain about. And he'll, he'll talk a little bit about, about guilt, but you'll also find that here as well. You'll find that people who are exceptionally prosperous a lot of times feel tremendous guilt for being prosperous. So then we start to develop these ideologies of, of contempt and, and bitterness and resentment and, and, uh, and um, uh, jealousy towards other people and other groups because, well, you know, we feel bad about being so, about being so, so wealthy, you know. Um, it's an interesting thing that, that, that Karl Marx, who never really had a real job, wrote about, about, the, about the exploitation of the masses and yet who was he being sponsored by? He was, being, he was completely supported by a friend of his, who's, uh, Engels, whose father was a textile merchant, very wealthy. So there's an interesting thing there where a person who, who, who never really worked was the champion of the worker. Now, why is that? Well, I imagine there's a significant level of guilt that applies to these kinds of things where we end up lashing out at, the people, at other people because we feel guilty about our own positions. And you do see a lot of that today, as, as controversial as that's going to be for me to say. Okay? And then the last sentence in paragraph 8, he says, the truth is that man does not uh, live by welfare alone. By welfare, he's not talking about what we think of as welfare. He just means that you know, in terms of money. You know, people don't live by, by money alone. So, questions about that? All right. Take a look at the next page, paragraph 9.